Warner Glenn and his daughter Kelly Glenn Kimbrough have to be one of the best lion hunting teams in this country, especially dry ground. They are true 100% professional dry ground lion hunters. They don't chase anything else, nothing but lions, that's all they do. They work out of their ranch, out of the southeast corner of Arizona, outside of Douglas, Arizona. And it's a rarity that they get a chance to see a lion up a tree because there aren't any trees to mount to anything. They do all of their treeing in, in cliffs and bluffs and on top of big rock ledges. Uh, they run 30 walkers, 16 mules, and they do it the old fashioned way. They just ride until they strike and they go from there. They don't hunt all of them at the same time. They'll split the 30 up into four teams of dogs and they rotate them to take care of them. Same with their mules. They'll rotate them every second or third day uh, because they like to take care of their stock. So sit back and enjoy. Oh, Kelly, Kelly is a made lion hunter in her own right. She can take the dogs and mules and go treat her own lion by herself anytime she wants has done it and she will uh, talk to you about that in her interview. So enjoy, please welcome Warner Glenn and his daughter Kelly Glenn Kimbrough, Douglas, Arizona. This is Warner Glenn. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Well, we're with Warner Glenn, and today is the 22nd of June of 2002. And Warner, uh, if you could tell us a little about yourself, you know, where you were born and what you've done with your life and, and that sort of thing. Bruce, I, I was uh, born and raised right here in, uh, I was born in Douglas, Douglas Hospital there, but I was raised on the cattle ranch 30 miles northeast of Douglas, right in the south end of the Chiricow Mountains. Uh, my granddad homesteaded there. He, he came here from Texas in 96, 1896, and homesteaded there around uh, 1908. Uh, and the Glens have been in that country ever since. My dad ran that ranch for years, and I, that's where I grew up. We uh, bought this old John Slaughter ranch here in 1960, and my wife Wendy and, uh, and I moved down here in uh, 61. So uh, at that time, my dad was taking care of the JBRA, which was the home ranch up there, the original Glen home, home ranch. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he started uh, uh, lion hunting in uh, 1936, the year I was born. And uh, he got a, uh, they, they couldn't raise any colts in that country. The lions got every colt they would try to raise, and they, he more or less started lion hunting out of self-defense, you might say, just to protect their own livestock. And of course, they lost a lot of calves too, but uh, he, he went down in the valley there around El Frida and got a, a red bone hound that he called Jack, and uh, started hunting with that hound. And, and the, for that fellow he bought him from said, well, he's never been in on a lion, but he's caught a lot of bobcats. So, uh, Jack, Daddy took him in on a fresh, uh, right after, he, shortly after he got the hound, he took him in on a fresh calf kill. And uh, old Jack started trailing around and they trailed around this mountain. And uh, uh, 
Daddy really didn't know much about hunting, so he doesn't know at what point uh, the, the jack jumped the line. Or if, in those days, uh, the line probably weren't as dog wide as they are nowadays, and all. And the line might have just been full of meat and climbed the tree. I don't know, but uh, Jack just ended up there, and the track just disappeared, just played out. And so Daddy was trying to help him on foot, and they were both looking for tracks. And my granddad was on the other side of the canyon, and he said. He said, what's the matter? And Daddy, uh, Daddy now this is Marvin, my dad, Marvin Glenn, he said, uh, uh, I don't know. He said, the tracks just disappeared. The dog can't go anywhere. And I read, my granddad said, well, why don't you look up? And that <laughs> and the above the tree. That's the first line he ever caught, and that's the dog he caught it with. But we, that's where I got, I, I was uh, more or less raised uh, either on a ranch, cowboy, or, or hunting. Line, so I've been in it a long time. Now your grandfather, now he didn't he didn't run hounds. Did no, he didn't. No. So there was your dad, Marvin. Yeah, that, that, Marvin's that, that, the one that started from my dad down. That was about 1936 when he got that first hound. Well, did did uh, your your dad have any particular strain of dog, or he just at that, he used? You know, at that time, uh, most of those hunters in those days, of course, the Lee boys were real, uh, real top hunters in those days. They were the best ones around and. Probably in all time, you know, for as far as dry ground hunters go, they would be right amongst the the, the better ones of the of the dry ground, what you call dry ground line hunters in the, in the southwest here. But uh, they, uh, hey. <laughs> but. Uh, Daddy started, most of those people in those days used the uh, uh, red bone and red tick and blue tick and uh, black and tan. And very few of them used walker hounds out here. Now they're, they probably, in walker hound country, they probably used them, you know, back in the Midwest and coon, coon sure. type hunting country. But, but uh, most of the dogs out here at that time were those old, uh, those old hounds that uh, a lot of those old hunters used. And Daddy, Daddy and I stayed with the blue tick and the red bone and red tick and and black and tans for up until the uh, 1958. We helped film a little old <clears throat> movie that the uh, fella trained a hound for. It was called Wet Back Hound, <laughs> and uh, Walt Disney made this movie, and and uh, that was a Walker Hound, and that was one of the smartest. <laughs> we didn't know they made hounds that smart, so. <laughs> Daddy said, well, you know, I believe I'm going to get me a couple of Walker pups, young dogs, and try to raise some of those. And so he got a male out of uh, Houses of Bali, and he got a uh, female out of Finley River Chief. At that time, there were two top coon hunting dogs, and uh, they started raising them. And that's where, and, and we went from about 1960 on, most of our dogs have been uh, Walker, uh, Trian Walker. Uh, hounds and and they they work good for us and we have a little bit of we've sprinkled a little uh, other things in there once in a while I have a couple right now that are half black and tan and I have one bitch down there that's half blue tick but most most of the dogs uh, that work good for us here now are the Walker tree and Walker. Would you consider them to be really cold those dogs or medium or hot nosed? Cold, cold enough. Uh, there that's a those older dogs we had could trail an older track, but a lot of times they would trail a track a day or two old, and you just wouldn't do any good. You'd do a lot of trailing, but not much catching. Now these dogs we have today will trail one. They'll trail an overnight track in this dry, uh, dry conditions. They'll trail one eight or ten or maybe a twelve hours old, and that's usually. As old a track as a fellow ought to be fooling with. <laughs> if they can't trail it, so I, I would. Uh, they've got a nose that can tra trail an old enough track. They're, they're good, and there's uh, some of, and, and it varies in the breed, of course. Uh, some of them are really got better nose than others, and we try to. Uh, Kelly and I hook together now all the time, and we try to keep a uh, one or two real good nose dogs in the bunch, for not only for strike dogs, but for cold trailing. And then uh, run some others in there that may not have quite a good a nose, but they're a little better on a fast, hot track, a little more of a pushing dog that want to move on out there and catch them. 
And then you got to have a couple that are good tree dogs, yeah. or locators. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the tree dog, I call them locators because in this country we catch a lot of these lines and bluffs or cliffs on ledges or, and those lines will crawl in there and get hit and the dogs can't see them. A lot of times they might be able to wind them, but a dog, some, it takes a good dog to locate dogs and bluffs. I mean, a line and bluffs or a lot of times they'll be in a cave or a hole, you know, and it's, uh, so I, you got to have a couple of good locators uh, once you get that line up and running. How long do you think it takes to make a good all-around dog? If you say if you were starting one from a pup, yeah. you train them yourself, would train it with these dogs here. How long do you think it'll take that? It, it depends on the dog, but I t at least a year and and to have him pull. I say two years for for real well trained. Uh, broke off a trash and one that'll really get in there and help and work hard on the track and help those other dogs. I, I would say two years. Two years. Yep, and that's working with good dogs. That's what you're getting them right in there and helping them. Uh, I, I mean, they're learning from by doing and seeing the others, the good dogs do what their job is, you know, in there. And I would say it was probably, more, that's average. Once in a while you get a good one in a year that's just turning handspring down to those lines. I mean, it depends. And a lot of times that can be in the same litter. You might have a litter and you might have four or five pups out of the same litter. Some of those dogs will be good the first year and some of them it'll sure take the two. If they haven't turned out pretty good in two years, you may be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying you need to get rid of them. I've had dogs go uh, up to three years and they're just fair. If they're no good at all, you sure don't want to keep them. You know? But but if if they're showing interest uh, in uh, getting in there and paying attention to what they're doing and, and not causing you a lot of trouble, I'll stay with them probably longer than some people would. And I've had a, some of those dogs I've stayed with that turned out to be awful good dogs eventually. Some are slower learners. They're like, <laughs> they're like us. <laughs> some of them learn quick. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit your hunting technique. Now I know a lot of guys will road hunt, they'll put a dog on the hood of the truck or on the, on the box, but I notice that, that you have all mules and everything and I think you're one of the few left who actually go out here and ride and, and, and try to stri strike a track. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, the country we hunt in, Bruce, uh, here you can't, one thing, we don't have many roads. There's a few roads that go through this country and, and also our setting conditions for, to, to have a dog on the hood of your vehicle, they've almost got to be able to pick up that scent in the air. In our humidity here, it's so dry that unless, unless that line gets across the road in front of you, they're not going to pick that. That, that humidity in the air doesn't hold that scent long enough uh, to, 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 to hold it so that dog can strike from the air. Unless, like I said, just ran across in front of you. I mean, that. So here, that that wouldn't in our country. That I don't believe that would work, and, and no, we don't do that. We do all of our hunting on, on mule back. Now we'll trailer these mules to an area, in, up, usually in one of these mountain ranges, and uh, unload and, and just start out riding on some of these good trails. We try to follow trails when we can, fairly good trail, just because. Uh, you can cover more ground on a better trail, and, and we let our dogs go out ahead of us. We don't hunt hardly over six dogs a day. I've got more dogs. I've got four packs, good packs. of six dogs in each pack of you. And uh, so, but but we do that to for, to take care of their feet. You can have a dog in real good shape, and if they work hard in this hot and bluffy rough country all day long on a line track, they're going to wear those pads through anyway. So you've got to, uh, we, when we're really hunting steady, we try to hunt them one hard day and then rest them three. And you can get by with just resting them two, but it's a little better for us uh, day after day, week after week, month after month to do, to, to hunt them one hard day and rest them three. But to get back to our hunting technique, we keep riding and let those dogs pick up the scent. And then of course, when they do, uh, you've got to find that track as soon as you can. And sometimes that's hard because this ground can be hard and rocky or could be covered with leaves or whatever, but you have to find that track, number one, to find out if you're trailing a lion. And usually, you can tell 
to the way those dogs are acting. And, but it might be a bobcat. It might be a good fresh bobcat track. They can trail a bobcat in this country if it's a fresh one. I mean, it, uh, but not very far, not very fast. So you can tell pretty quick. And then, number two, you've got to see which way that line's going. Because most dogs, 50% of the time, will hit it going backwards. Mm -hmm. Ours hit it going backwards more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to find that track to make sure you're going the right way, and then and then just stay with those dogs and try to work it out. Now, if, if you say say if you have the six out there, you yoke five of them and just no. run one straight. No, you run them all. When we're hunting, I leave them all. Unless I have a young dog. Now, if I have a young dog or two in the bunch, I'll I'll leave those neck. Those two young dogs. I just leave them neck together until uh, it, until they get on a good track and we know it's a line and go the right way. And then I turn them all loose and let them. And I watch them. And I use those training collars, those shocking collars on those young dogs. And that if I see a deer jump out or something, I really watch because, uh, and Kelly does too, if one of us sees the, what's happening, you know, and it, so we know if that young dog, usually you can tell pretty quick even if you don't see if that young dog goes kai off somewhere and those other dogs don't go, you better pop him a little bit and get him back because you know it's no good. So it, uh, they can tell you a lot just by watching their old dogs. And it really helps. These fellas that are starting out just hunting, and they, they're, they're all, everybody wants to buy an old, wore out dog that'll just trail line. And, and they need one. That kind of dog is worth his weight in gold because they can tell right away what those young dogs are doing by watching that old dog, and they know that. These people know that, and, and that kind of a dog is awful hard to find. But but uh, we we don't. I I leave those. We we usually have at least six good dogs when we go out. Uh, I mean, trained dogs that know what they're doing and, and are supposed to. And we don't neck them. We we unless we're once in a while we'll tree a line and for some reason we don't want to kill it. And then I I carry neck and strap on the side all the time. Then we neck those dogs together to get them away from that tree and go on, I'm either a female sucking kittens or or for some reason. Uh -huh. Sometimes the client doesn't want to kill, I mean it might be a half grown lion and, and we don't ask the client to shoot anything except an adult lion. Uh, we, we tell them an adult lion, male or female, is le it's legal in Arizona and, and that's uh, considered a, on our part is that we've done our job if we catch one. But, but a, lie, a female sucking kittens, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. I'd tell them what the deal is and, if, and leave it up to them. It's legal to kill one in Arizona. New Mexico, it's not, if, if you know they're sucking mm -hmm. little ones. But uh, Arizona, it's legal, but uh, usually the hunter says, let's go on and try for something else. You know, the client does. And, and we're, we're willing to do that. Yeah. That helps us down the road. Well, sure it does. Sure. You, meant, you mentioned the shocking collars. Uh, I, I, I know that you hunted before those things ever even showed up. Yeah. Uh, how much of an advantage are the shotgun collars versus the way you used to have to do it? We used to have to, when when you knew a dog was running a deer or a javelina hog or a fox or whatever, trash game I call it, uh, you'd have to just outrun them and just stop them. I, I mean, some way. Either cut them off, and that was, oh, it was a mule killing or a man killing son of a gun to do that. I yeah. mean, this rough country, you just, a lot of times those dogs just get away from you. That's yeah. all there is to it. Boy, I tell you, with these shocking collars, when you know, now you don't want to be too quick on the trigger, but you, you've got time. You've got, with those collars, they, they give you time. You can watch your old dog. If they don't go with that young dog, you're 90% sure that dog's wrong. And if, also, if you see the game, you can let that dog get out there and make sure he's trailing it before you pop him. And and that dog, it just trains them so much faster because they they realize what they're doing wrong. A little longer and ride along and and trust that thing rather than staying up with those dogs and see which dogs are doing what. Uh -huh. And and also, there's a lot of places in this country that you've got to help those dogs. I mean. A lot of people, I've heard a lot of old timers say, well, I don't ever help my dogs because they get to depending on you and then they don't work. Well, I tell you, in this country, in dry ground hunting, in the, in, in the country we hunt, you're not gonna, if you don't help those dogs, you're not going to catch me in line. I mean, they just can't do it all by themselves. They're, I mean, sometimes they will, don't get me wrong. 
but boy, if you help them, you're going to be successful a lot more of the time. And, and I mean taking them through real rough cliffs, bluffy, taking them around or helping them up through places or helping them figure out a, 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 where a line has come back out and you know, and gone out another way or something. There's just a lot of things you can do to help them. But a lot of people's packs of hounds, you'll have a hound or two, we do, and I think everybody that has many trained hounds will have a dog or two that's wonderful dogs. They're good trailers and they've got a tremendous desire, but they don't bark much. And you watch those dogs. If you're with your dogs and you watch those dogs, usually they'll be out ahead and you can tell the way they're, they're by their body language when they're on that track. And boy, when you see them pop that tail and just just pull out, and you better get those other dogs and go over there and put them on that thing, because you know, I mean, you learn that, and you can't do that by sitting on your mule somewhere with a track dog. And we try to stay, we try to stay on those, don't get me wrong, we try to stay on those mules as long as we can. We're, and it's not hardly ever on a good trail, excuse me. But you can get it. This country isn't that bad. I, there's some areas you can't negotiate on a mule at all, of course, and it's all footwork, and, and that's, uh, that's uh, it's hard to stay right with your dogs in that kind of country, even a foot, even if you're in pretty good shape. Uh, but it, but it, it's uh, tracking collars. I don't, I, I have, we haven't started using them yet. Yeah. We might someday. Yeah. What about bears? Did you ever run those? Yeah, years ago, uh, we had dogs that run bear and I don't let them run them now if we didn't help it now they I'm not saying they would a bear jump right out in front of them I'm not saying they wouldn't run it but they're they won't co trail a bear these dogs go right over a lot of bear tracks nowadays and one reason for that we have a we only have a one week of open season on bear here on in our area so it would hamper us quite a bit if the dogs were trailing bear all the time we hunt a lot when bears aren't, but they hibernate in this country not very long, but they do right from about the 20th of December till about the middle of February or first of March, they will hibernate. So they, they would be a problem, but we don't. Uh, my dad used to run bear. Yeah. Huh. What about lion scrapes? Do you, uh, do you think that lion makes it with the front feet or the rear feet, or do you know? No doubt about it, they make them with their hind feet. The hind feet. The rear feet. Yep. No, no doubt. We've seen. We had uh, a couple of lion kittens we caught when they were real little. We had kept them till they were two years old, and that old Tom got. He, he would scratch. We, we would. Uh, they would be uh, separating. We'd keep one on a leash, and the other one would be uh, out there. And we were, we watched that Tom lion scratch. And and now, don't get me wrong. They'll. They'll make mounds with their front feet and, and they'll cover up kills with their front feet like, you know, right. like the regular house cat. But when they scratch, when they make that scrape uh, for communications of some sort uh, to other lines or whatever, marking the target, whatever that reason would be, they do that with their hind feet. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll urinate on that mound, that the, the, or the, the, I'm not going to call it a mound, but the, the pile at the rear end of the scratch, they'll, they'll urinate on that. And if you watch, a lot of times in the bluffs and things like that, like under ledges and up next to bluffs, uh, a lot of those scratches will be made right up to the to the solid rock wall and there's no way in the world a lion could get in there with its front feet. I mean, there are different things you can see that make you realize that this, not only watching that uh, tame lion that we had, it was that uh, kitten that grew up and we kept it, like I said, till it was two. But uh, not only watching him do it with his hind feet, but, but the, the, watching the places he scra scrapes her in uh, would uh, be almost impossible for him to do with her front feet. You, you keep mentioning dry land hunting and everything. I, I know that there's a lot of people, uh, the coon hunters and stuff, they don't have an idea, a clue as to what you're talking about. But. You know, and that, that when they call that dry ground, what, when lion hunters are talking about dry ground hunting, they're, 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 they usually mean you're not hunting in the snow belt. Yeah. In the snow belt. And, and, and when you say dry land, that doesn't mean that it's got to be dusty, dry, where you're doing it. It's just bare ground. 
I, I would rather say bare ground hunting. That that should be more work than dry. But but a lot of people just say, and I do it a lot of times too, dry ground hunting. But that that's uh, hunting in areas where there, where you, where you don't have the advantage. And I would say snow is an advantage. Some and I haven't done that much hunting in snow. But when we do get a snow in this country in the higher elevation, it sure makes it a lot <laughs> easier to hunt. One thing, you can find that track so quick when your dogs pick it up and find which way it's going and what it is. Uh -huh. You know, that's, and, and also trailing conditions for the dogs. It's sure. just so much better. Yeah. Have you ever been seriously hurt when out hunting? You know, I never have. Never been, no. Uh, I probably come, come close, uh, probably, I tell you the most dangerous thing we have here when you're hunting is when you're prowling around in these cliffs and your dogs are working and, and things is a loose rock, a loose rock rolling. Uh, and that's uh, not only you might dislodge a rock that might bo go off like a cannonball down a hill and hurt one of your dogs or your mules or somebody, but one of your dogs might do the same above you. Yeah, that is really a concern and something we really try to watch for when we're going in on a line. Is, uh, especially if he's bathed in a cliff somewhere or something like that, you really have to watch for loose, because uh, boy, a whole edge of a bluff could fall off if, if you, I mean, some of this stuff is r loose, shelly stuff, and, and uh, Kelly and I both have had some pretty close calls, uh, but but none, of, neither one of us has fallen off yet uh, and gotten hurt bad. Uh, uh, another thing that is, concerns you is your mule falling with you, but that's uh, that's where that mule comes in then. That mule's usually going to take care of himself in that rough country, and while he's been taking care of himself, he's going to be taking care of you along with it. And a, and a mule is a great asset, in, a, as you know, in, in rough country. And I'm not saying there's some good, there's not a lot of good horses. I mean, I've seen some awful good mountain horses, but generally speaking, we kind of, nowadays, we stick to mules just for, and one reason, not only for keeping up with those dogs, but uh, for safety, Yeah, safety reason. Have you ever been scared out in the hunting or out in the woods or out in the mountains? Uh, scared of anything? I've been, yeah, a lot of times. I've been scared I wasn't going to catch that line. <laughs> <laughs> Go out and buy you a good line dog. You're talking anywhere from five to ten thousand bucks. I mean, a dog that's young enough to to have a few years left in it, and well trained, sure. and one that you can you work some young dogs with to help train those young dogs. You're you're talking big money, and a good mule is going to cost you. I mean, like fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred bucks. Sure. I mean, one that you can take you in those mountains and not hurt you. You don't want a bronc mule up there. You don't want one that's going to kick a dog and kill that five thousand dollar dog, yeah. you know, or break its shoulder or whatever. I mean, you've yeah. got to have a fairly good mule. Yeah. And if you're taking clients, if you're going to do this to make pay uh, or get some revenue out of it, you better take a client along that's interested in, in paying for this hunt. And you've got to have a mule that's going to take care of that fella, sure. not going to hurt him. Yeah. Now we have Kelly. Uh, Kelly, when, how old were you when you started out hunting with your father? Um, I started hunting with my grandpa and my father when I was in my early teens, in between school, and then when, when I graduated from high school I was 17, and I went straight into hunting with them. I had decided I didn't need to go get a college education, and so, because I liked hunting, so I hunted for two years. And then my aunt and uncle decided that they needed to show me a college. <laughs> so I went to college for three and a half years to Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, California. And then I came back and I worked in the movie industry as a casting and location person part-time and hunted the, so that it worked out that I could do both. I was single and that's one reason it worked out is because my only commitments were to here and to my movie work. But um, but at that point, it was starting to get pretty steady. My grandpa was still hunting, and um, and then he got sick. And at that point, I started hunting full-time with Dad. Then my grandpa passed away, and I kept hunting full-time. And then I met my husband and told him that 
in order to marry me, I had to keep hunting. <laughs> and so, so I did, and so here I am, and that's. So now, uh, whenever you go out, uh, and say you're taking clients out and everything like that, what is your official duties when, when you do I'm this? the client caretaker. You take care of them. Yeah. I, well, we go, some days we, depending on the client, a lot of our clients are repeat customers. They know our process, they know how we hunt, and plus they know the country's really tough, and they know this, and that's, they want to come back because it's an adventure and a challenge for them. But that makes it easier for Dad and I because then we can split up. When we some days when we make our circles, the country permits us to split up, and I take like one old dog, and Dad takes the others. And then if I hit a track, I can pretty well read what the one dog is doing versus having to read what six of them are doing. And then I let Dad know, and usually I hit them going backwards. And if I ever hit them going the right way, they're going right towards water, <laughs> and he gets in on it before I do. <laughs> oh, well, that's not fair. No, that's a good but, part about it. Yeah, we. Yeah, that's a good part. He likes it when I call and tell him I've hit a track yeah. and it's going his but way. Splitting up that way it just gives you twice as good a chance of getting on a good track early, sure. and that's right. what we try to do. Yeah. And here it's a lot of the like two thirds of the time that we're hunting. It's important that we do something early because we have heat and drought and whatever to deal with. And, and if your dogs can hit it when they're fresh, then you might have better success that day. Well, I, I, I know that there's a lot of people out there who know of you. And, <laughs> and uh, they have a very high regard of you and your, your line hunting ability. Oh, well, that's nice. I, I didn't know if you knew that or not, but there, Thank there's you. been several of them who tell me that. that that they consider you a made lion hunter in your own right. Oh, so, how nice. But, um... Warner and I question that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't really. I, we, we thank you for passing that on. Yeah, that's us. nice. It, uh, it but, is, so, I would agree with them. She sure is. Having said that, and I know, I know what the answer is, but I'll ask you anyway. I mean, do you think you'd have any problem at all in taking a mule and six dogs and go chase a lion by yourself? Uh, no, I, I know I would have more problems because I wouldn't, we work together, mm -hmm. but but I have caught a couple by myself. Really? Yeah, so, <laughs> and when dad, dad had prostate cancer and they, um, they removed his prostate and so they said for 30 days he couldn't ride and I mean, day 31 he was riding, <laughs> but, but in that time of those 30 days, a cowboy from a local ranch who helps us sometimes, he, we had five different lions that we went and caught, the cowboy and I, because he would go with me to help me with the dogs and help me with the whole situation. Um, and Dad would go in the pickup and <laughs> keep very close. Carry, carry my little bag. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then we would, you know, and it helped because there's, like, the younger dogs. Dad works with them all year. And in the summer, I am a mother. And, and now Mackenzie's in school, so I try to do the mom thing. And so I don't get, I'm not here like today when dad was exercising the dogs, I wasn't here. Uh -huh. And he kind of, some of the young dogs, I don't know how to read them yet. And so I can ask him, I can say, you know, this dog is doing this, do I trust him or, or not? And he'll say, well, you know, watch him for a minute or whatever. But I mean, it worked very well and we caught some lions. But most of the time the lions that, that I catch are kind of an accident. Because, well, it's it's totally an accident. Usually, I I I happen to be in the right place at the right time. Oh, so. Okay. Uh, as far as getting down to getting back to the dry ground hunting or the barren ground hunting, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, things with scent that people uh, people just don't realize, and 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 it really uh, even the dog it confuses dogs because you can be trailing a a fresh a line track that you might have a line up moving ahead of you and those uh, you'd think ordinarily those dogs could hit that scent channel and pull out and those lines would hit a dusty cow trail or or blow sand or that type of deal and and turn down that trail and fall it away and then turn out and when those dogs hit that, that dusty real powdery dusty trail or, or blow sand or type thing that scent just absolutely disappears that type of soil does not hold the, uh, the scent. And unless a hunter 
if unless you're there helping those dogs and you you've kind of seen this happen before, you might think, boy, something's wrong, and you'll go back and and waste a lot of time where you should be just following that track. Because that's one thing when they do hit something like that, the we man can see, can see the track. So you just follow it, and the minute it turns off, they'll <coughs> turn off of that trail or something. They'll fly on it again. Also, but, bedding grounds where cattle bed down oh, and terrible. fires where there's, where been, there's a fire. been a fire through. There's a lot of ash. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you there's, can be trailing a fresh track, but the only thing, like, you, you can see it, so the man... Yeah, we can get them through over. it. Yeah. You can get them through it, but you got to know this goes on, and, and so there's so many things that enters into scent. A lot of the... It can be that not only I mentioned earlier the scent in the air, the humidity in the air that'll hold that scent channel, so to speak, but also the moisture content in the soil. If it's damp, of course, you, if the scent condition is so much better, if it's dry, it's terrible. But another thing is hard, a hard surface will hold that sand. Even in this dry, hot weather, if they rock, walk across a bluffy, or solid rock surface, those dogs can just trail the heck out of it. Because yeah. it's a solid surface. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's grass or, or leaves or something where the, there's disturbance in the <coughs> movement, that scent dissipates a lot faster. So it's a lot of, when you're trailing the line, you're wondering what, the, you trail it so good for so far and then all of a sudden these dogs just slowed up and you're going to think, well, I must have switched track. Now that's a possibility. The always got to keep that in mind because they can do that. But a lot of times it's just the, the setting conditions and the type of soil and the type of the, uh, the, the hardness, the, the surf, surface that they're going over. If you're in a real brushy country, those dogs will trail by smelling the body scent of that line where it's rubbed those leaves on the brush. A lot of that forest country is really good for trailing. Uh, because they can trail, and dogs will learn that. A lot of dogs will trail off the brush, and some dogs will never smell the leaves. I mean, they'll they'll just try to do it on the ground all the time. So uh, there's a lot to do with that scent that yeah. people just don't realize what's going on. Now, if a lion goes up a cow trail or through a, yeah. a bedding ground or, or, or the, through the, the fire burn or whatever, do you think that lion does that on purpose? No, I, I don't really. I think it's just circumstance. Yeah. I think it just happened to happen. Now, I'm not saying, and I've seen some lions do some awful, smart, seemingly smart things. Uh, Usually when you're running them, though. Yeah. When they know you're in pursuit. You, you, and, and, they, and they'll get, a lot of times, a, a dog wise lion that's been trailed a lot and run a lot in this country, sometimes they'll. They'll go, they'll start, when they hear those dogs come in a ridge over like a half a mile, they'll they'll pull out at a trot, and a lion can trot all day long, and boy, you're not gonna catch that sucker. It's gonna get dark on you before you do, they can just trot. But if they make, if you make them panic and they run, they can't run very far because they're short-winded, and you'll probably get them caught. But those dogs, those lions that'll pull out, not only will they pull out, but then they get over a ridge and they don't hear that those dogs coming, they might come right back on their tracks and get on top of the ridge again and listen. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so, and then they hear them still coming, so they'll take off another way. I mean, just by chance, but they're getting out of there. Well, the dogs trail over the ridge and out to that dead end where that line turns around and come back. And man, is that hard for dogs to figure out. And we you have might, to start looking. Oh, you've got to help. If we find a track coming back, then we know that's what they did. Then we got to find the point they yeah. turned. And you think, you think, well, that line did that on purpose. It, well, it did, but it wasn't really trying to throw your dogs off. It was coming back to see if you hear those dogs coming and then take off, you know, to see if it was still being followed. And, and so, see, some of the things the line does seemingly are really smart when when other times they're just it's survival for them of course and I'm, I don't think they think like we do like I'm gonna go out here and put a backtrack in there and go off another direction you know where where a convict or something lay on a trail for a dog yeah. might do that and, and get away with, if you know something about dog but but they those lines will do that now I've seen lines running down a canyon the dogs within a hundred yards of them on that scent channel and that lion will know that he's getting in trouble and getting tired. He'll jump out of, of this bank and, and squat behind the bush and let every dog run by. Because the scent get up. floating. Yeah. yeah, and then you get up and look. Now, I've seen this because I've been on the bluff above and watching this happen. 
and I've seen them look around and then they'll go right back in the creek and come right back up the canyon, right to the bluffs as here. Yeah. Now this happened in this, and, and I'm not saying he wasn't using his head. He was getting tired and he knew he was in trouble and, and he figured he'd get back to the bluff. Well, those dogs go down there and they hit a dead end of, a, of the scent channel and, and then they've got to figure out what happened. Boy, it takes a smart dog to come back up there the way they just ran in because they think they're backtracking. And, and now and then. It's, a, it's, a, it's an education. <laughs> One of our real old dogs by then is very tired. And they're oh. coming along on the track, four or 500 yards, and they run right into that line yeah, and they trail. How, and we've uh, seen that happen because he'll yeah. be running, or with that old dog afoot. So yeah. he's that far behind the lead dogs, but he can stay with the old dog. because And then here comes the lion and the old dog runs into it and trees it. Or at least scares it out of the creek enough to get a new track so it's yeah. not on its old tracks and then dad can call the other dogs up and and we've had them in bluffs where we knew i'll tell dad you know crackles half a mile behind you dad and then i'll say dad she must have jumped the lion well the lion that particular day went up through the bluffs and then did this, that deal and went right back down through all the dogs because they were it was rough and they were all scattered out trying to find the track went right through where they were and ran right into Crackle. Oh, I mean, yeah. and then she bade him on a bluff because then yeah. he stopped. Yeah. You know. What's it like to get lucky? Yeah. Yep. In the, in the book that Dub Evans wrote, Slash Ranch Hound, yep. he published or he, he quoted a letter from the Lee brothers and Dub Evans also said that he had seen the same thing. And I found this very, very hard to believe but it's almost is what you're saying. And in that letter, they were saying that once they got that line up and running real, real good and dogs were starting to get a little closer to them, that that line would run under a big pine tree and go about 100 yards, turn around, come back, and make a high jump onto that tree and let the dogs run under it. And, and they swore that. And, and I mean, have you ever seen that? Or I don't, yeah. I, I haven't seen the lion do that, but I've seen where that is bound to happen because the dogs will go by and I'll be coming along there afoot and either see the lion or what are already in the tree and those dogs will be trailing way past it. And I'll think, well, those dumb son of a gun. You know, <laughs> and, and I go, to, but that's, evidently that is what's happened. And, and I think a lion does that, not that, he might be thinking the biggest, highest tree he can find just to try and get away from those dogs. And when he runs by it, he says, man, I've goofed up and he might go back and, and make that jump. Now, when they make that jump, it, it's, it's a pine tree a lot of times doesn't have a limb until you get up there 15 or 20 feet, so they've got in. I would think they would make a big jump just to... Especially on a steep mountain. Yeah, where yeah they especially, get into yeah. It from the upper and I don't side. know if they would do that as far as trying to throw your dogs off, but they do it. I mean, and so I wouldn't doubt them a bit. And they might be absolutely right. They might be this, you know. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't doubt. I'm, I'm sure they've seen that happen. And, and yeah. uh, they did a lot of hunting in a lot of timber country. We don't, we're, we don't have the advantage of big timber here as they would in a lot of those areas. Uh, you're talking about uh, good hunters. Uh, of course, in, 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 I think those Evans, there was a lot of those good hunters that were in that country. That was probably New Mexico where he sure. was yeah, there right. now. And, uh, and uh, of course, the Lee boys were great hunters. And, and what they would tell you, I wouldn't doubt a bit. Some of the things that hunters will tell you sound far-fetched and hard to believe, but uh, uh, they're probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably true, and, and a guy, uh, some of the things we've seen are absolutely unbelievable, but uh, but but you've seen it once and you know it could happen, you know. Well, and we've said to each other, I wouldn't have believed that if, I, if we hadn't seen it happen. Yeah. But I, you have to consider your, it's nature and animals is what makes a lot of this happen, mm -hmm. and that's totally unpredictable. Nature's unpredictable and that lion is, you know, it's they're totally unpredictable. You don't know what they're thinking. Nobody does and they don't know what the dogs are thinking either. And we see dogs do awesome things like a young dog. Yeah. And we're like, wow. And I, I know if this was an accident, it's like me catching a lion by myself. I had to be in the right place at the right time and things just happened right. Yeah. You you keep you keep saying that you have the hunter has to help those dogs. Would you say it would be 60% hunter or 75% hunter? 
No. No. Uh, uh, Down here? No. In this country? Yeah. I'd say it'd be 70. You mean uh, the, uh, your success depends on uh, the... Or I'm just catching that line. I, I'd say that your success would be 80% on the dogs. 80 on the dogs. I would. Yeah. And, and 20 on the hunters. I uh, you got, but without that 20%, if you don't help them, uh, you might not catch anything. Yeah. But, but you know, but I, I would, I, I tell you, a good dog, whew, you've got to have a good dog. Yeah. You're, you're, anybody can go out there with a cow dog or a, or a cur once in a great while and trail line, yeah. anywhere. But by golly, I'll tell you, when you if you catch very many lines, you better have some good dogs. Also, Dad, helps his dogs and and you were saying earlier about some of the hunters said if you help them they get to, no, I, you said, I said that that, yeah. that they get to depend and that's not true with dads yeah, yeah. when he points to the ground they know that that's that he he'll be ahead of them like 30 feet when when in the places it's a lot of dirt and he'll will follow that track to and man when he points those dogs he's just like another dog to them it's like he's barking when he's pointing uh -huh. and they're there and then they go on with it and the older yeah. dogs the older dogs, will, one of them sometimes, even though they can barely smell it, they trust him to know that he sees it for sure. And they'll bark, just one bark, but it gets them all going again there. Then they can start hunting from that point instead of some poor young dog back there, 50 feet, still trying to find where he last smelled it, yeah. and he's wasting precious time and energy. And so that's they trust Dad. And in the bluffs, Dad will call him over, and he'll let them down by their collars and their tails like yeah. to the next ledge yeah. and they'll let him do that because they know he knows that lion went off there yeah. and a lot of times I'll be sitting with the client on top of a bluff because of it's so rough and I'll get to see the lion move way out ahead of him and then I just tell dad where it moved out and he calls those dogs and they go right with him and he'll get around there and sometimes it's 200 yards away or 300 or across the canyon and yet he cut off hours of trailing time This so country, any time you can say it, any words you can say those dogs, you better do it because you're yeah. going to need that later. Because they're physically being in Because you're going to run out of daylight or run out of dog power right. if you don't. Yeah. Know, you know, and, and, they'll, and a lot of the helping, I, I watch, like I mentioned earlier, I watch those dogs. Sometimes it might be a dog that doesn't bark too much, silent type dog. And I watch them a lot. And, and boy, if I, if I know, if I see them popping that tail and and, and going on, I know they're on it. I'll call those dogs and point, and, they, and yeah. sure enough, those older dogs will come and bark and go on. You know what? It, it helps you move the track. Yeah, you've got it. In this country, you got to do that. Up there in that country where they hunt the snow belt and things, that, I, that's not as necessary. I, I think those guys probably leave most of that up their dogs, and, and that's where a lot of them use the tracking collars mm -hmm. uh, because they let those dogs go on, and those dogs can do it in that snow and, and yeah. it's I'm not putting them down in any way I, I mean that that's a it's a wonderful thing and those guys uh, do a good job catching a lot of lions in that in the snow belt type country what the knowledge uh, lions are uh, these old tom lines that you hit sometimes you can hit those tracks in a saddle or on a ridge or in a canyon and they'll follow those canyons or ridges a long way as going because they're traveling they're covering ground and they're they might be five times as easy to trail as a female lion. Mm -hmm. When you get on a female, not only are they heavier and leave more scent, but they're going straighter usually. A female, they'll they'll go. They just they have a hard time figuring out where they're going. We and we admit that. <laughs> so, that the camera's running here, Ward. Yeah. <laughs> but they, and they're, I admit they're, that because they're meandering around. They hardly ever follow a canyon over a hundred yards. Yeah. I mean, they they, they got to turn up and go up on this mountain and see what's up there. Or they, or they, you know, and they'll rim the side of these mountains and or go straight off and straight up where an old Tom might hit a canyon and go a long way and you can go at a trot and make a lot of ground on them. Yeah. So females are harder to catch. He'll that know. might be nature's way of preserving the species, you know. I mean, that's one thing probably has something to do He'll with it. He'll tell our clients, well, it's going to be hard to catch if it's a female. And they'll be sitting there and pretty soon they'll, he'll be gone and they'll say, Why'd your dad say that? And I'm like, because she doesn't know where she's going. <laughs> we have no idea to predict you where she is. You can't figure them out. <laughs> if we catch any flack, it'll probably be over that statement. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tell them I'm yeah. agree.